G'day, welcome to my Lithium Battery Masterclass video series for 2024. In this video, part three, I'm gonna talk about different lithium cell types and configurations, cylindrical cells, pouch cells, and prismatic cells. Plus, I'll talk about why you want brand new cells, and I'll talk about the difference between grade A and grade B cells and all the rest. Now in the last video, I went in depth into what a lithium ion battery actually is and how it works. Plus I compared different lithium types like lithium iron phosphate and lithium cobalt. So if you're interested, make sure you check out that video. In this video, first I'll look at the different lithium cells from a size and shape perspective. Then I'll look at each one individually to look at its pros and cons. And at the end, we can compare all three. The three most common types are cylindrical cells like this, pouch cells like this, and prismatic cells like this. Whatever they look like on the outside, they're all very similar on the inside. They all have a positive electrode layer, a negative electrode layer, and a separator, which is where the electrolyte is held. It just means they're wound, stacked, all layered in different ways. Cylindrical cells are similar to commonly available batteries like double A's. They have a metal casing and the internal electrodes are tightly wound. Pouch cells feature a thin lightweight aluminium coating. These have stacked electrodes. Finally, prismatic cells usually have a steel alloy or plastic case and the internal electrodes are folded and stacked. The main difference is obviously shape and size, and usually a cell is chosen for its final configuration. Say you wanted a slim device, like a torch. A cylindrical cell is perfect for that. If you had a need for a lightweight, high power cell that was quite slim, then a pouch cell might be perfect. Something like a jump starter. Finally, a prismatic cell works in this sort of battery. Because it's square, you can fit the cells together and maximize space. Looking at weight by capacity, cylindrical cells are the heaviest. Because they're small, you need many more of them to make up a larger capacity battery, and therefore a lot of weight exists just in each individual case. By contrast, pouch cells are the lightest, with that thin and lightweight casing. Prismatic cells are in the middle. They have heavier cases, but because they offer more capacity in a single cell, less of the overall weight of the cell is due to the case. In terms of thermal management, cylindrical cells and prismatic cells are still good, but pouch cells win out. The lightweight metal case that offers plenty of surface area gives them the ability to spread any internal heat and dump it externally into the ambient air. For durability, cylindrical cells are arguably best, with prismatic cells a close second. Pouch cells can actually be quite vulnerable to damage or punctures. The other durability issue is with cylindrical and pouch cells, because individually they have much smaller capacity, there's a need for many more cells to be connected and therefore many more connection points to make up a larger capacity battery, which overall increases the potential for issues. So in that sense, we'll give the win to prismatic. For actual energy density, pouch is most effective. Individually, cylindrical and prismatic are similar, but when fitted into a battery casing, prismatic cells are much better for energy density because they fit together or tessellate. With cylindrical cells, you have big gaps between each cell, making for a bigger volume overall. If you're looking for rugged and durable cells with minimal connection points, therefore minimal potential failure points, good energy density, good power to weight ratio, good thermal management, then you've got to look at prismatic cells. Now that's not to say that cylindrical and pouch cells don't have their place depending on the application. Regardless of the type of lithium cells you're using, it's worth knowing that an individual cell has a nominal voltage of around 3.2 volts. So let's use some lithium iron phosphate cylindrical cells and some common household batteries as a good example of this. Let's say you had a torch like this and you had multiple batteries in series. That means you've got negative to positive to negative to positive to negative to positive. A single cell here would be one and a half volts. 
So two cells in series would be three volts and four cells in series would be approximately six volts, four times the original. On the other hand, if these batteries were combined at their negative and positive terminals, it would still be one and a half volts, but it would double the capacity. So we can use that with lithium ion phosphate cells to get to a 12.8 volt nominal figure. A single cell here has about 3.3 volts. But if I measure across the whole pack of four in series, I get around 13 volts. Each of these lithium ion phosphate cells has six amp hours of capacity. So by putting four in series, I've got to 12.8 volts. And by putting four in parallel, I've got 24 amp hours. So now you can see why different cells suit different applications. Cylindrical cells are fine for smaller electronics like a 12 or 24 amp hour power pack, but if you wanted a 120 amp hour battery using these, you would need 80 cells, which would mean a lot of connections. So now let's compare prismatic cells to the same as the previous setup. This is what you'd find inside an Adventure King's 120 amp hour lithium ion phosphate battery. So rather than needing many, many cylindrical cells up to about 80 with 80 potential connections, prismatic cells are able to do the same capacity with many fewer connections, but you've still got the same voltage per cell of around 3.2 volts, and then the same four cells in series for 12.8 volts nominal. Next up, I'm going to talk about the importance of brand new cells compared to secondhand cells. Lithium iron phosphate cells can typically perform about 2000 full cycles from 100% full all the way down to 0% full 2000 times. After those 2000 cycles, you would typically have around 80% of your original battery capacity. So if this was a 100 amp hour battery, after 2000 cycles, it will be down to about an 80 amp hour battery. So you can still use it, it just doesn't have its full capacity. The issue is it's not a linear aging process. So if you've got a secondhand cell, you don't know where it is in that process and how many cycles it's already done. The aging curve looks a lot like this, which means at some point in a lithium iron phosphate cell's life, it will degrade quite rapidly. This point can be accelerated if the cell has been used in less than ideal conditions like low or high temperature, or has been worked hard through charging or discharging. The short answer is, even if you test a secondhand lithium battery and it tests close to full capacity, you don't really know if it's performed 100 cycles or 1000 cycles. So you don't know where it is on this curve. So where possible, make sure you're choosing a battery with brand new cells so you can look after it and get the most out of it. As an example of how life can be affected by temperature, you'd want to keep your lithium iron phosphate cells below about 40 degrees. In one study, the same cell when fully discharged and charged over and over at 15 degrees, 25 degrees and 35 degrees Celsius respectively, was able to perform about 9,000, 7,000, and 4,500 cycles. So keeping your battery temperature down can make a big difference to overall life. So you'd wanna know how your secondhand battery has been treated. It might've been overcharged and therefore overheated, or it might've been used in extreme temperatures. This leads on to cell grading as in a grade A or a grade B or a grade C cell. This is a bit of a dark art because every supplier, manufacturer and seller seems to have a different definition of grade A. But a true grade A cell must hit a list of predetermined specifications at the time it's manufactured according to the manufacturer's spec sheet. It needs to be the correct capacity within a couple of percent it needs to be the correct voltage above a certain threshold, and it needs to be the correct internal resistance. Not only that, it needs to look physically correct and be the right overall dimensions. So if a battery is not any of those things, it's technically a class B battery, 
It's really hard to know though, just by looking at them. Grade B batteries might come from the same batch as grade A batteries, but they don't adhere to those physical or performance specifications. So let's say it was a 100 amp hour cell that was only able to output 95 amp hours, it would then go into the grade B class. Now there's nothing wrong with a grade B battery in itself, so long as you're aware that it is a grade B battery and you're happy that it may not be the full correct specifications of the grade A equivalent. Where it seems to get a little hazy is that you see some suppliers or sellers claiming grade A secondhand cells. And that can't strictly be true because it's very unlikely that a secondhand cell would pass those strict specification requirements. In fact, they're probably not even testing them to those strict requirements. It might have been grade A when it was manufactured, but it definitely isn't now after it's done a thousand cycles. The other thing is you don't know how it's been treated. It'd be a bit of a shock if you found out that your supposed secondhand grade A battery had been used in an electric vehicle for several years and was not performing anywhere near where it should be by the time you get it. Now, of course, if you buy a battery that has grade A cells, you leave it in the box and then you sell it to a mate, that's technically a secondhand grade A battery, but critically, it hasn't been used. And this all ties into Australian compliance and Australian standards. So if you're interested, keep an eye out because I will be doing a video deep dive into exactly that topic to see just who is and who isn't compliant. Now that you have a good idea of the different lithium cell types and configurations and the pros and cons of each, make sure you keep an eye out for the next part of this series where I go in depth onto what a BMS or battery management system is and how to make the most of your lithium iron phosphate battery.